This is for you. Katie, y'all ready? This is for Machine. This is for of Jacob Gould, Sam Houston High School senior for his national documentary about Louisiana Coastal Restoration. And Mr. Kirk Quinn is going to say a little bit about it here. Of rest restoration projects for our coastal communities. Uh, Jacob, if you would come up front right here, right quick. I ask all y'all come out front, please. Let's take a picture. Watch a little video of what Jacob has done. Hurricane. Impacts a hurricane could bring that can affect a region for years to come. Coastal erosion. It's something Scooter Charles Claire, the Rockefeller Wildlife Refuge Manager in Cameron Parish, Louisiana, says he sees every day. Just in the short period of time of me being involved here since 1990 at Rockefeller, we've lost 3,600 feet of shoreline, which is incredible. If you think of the 3,600 feet of land, if it still existed as a hurricane moves inland, that land is going to reduce the power of that storm to where the communities further north, instead of experiencing 130 miles an hour, they may just experience a 90 mile an hour wind, which makes a huge difference. Southwest Louisiana knows this issue all too well. That's why the region is in desperate need for federal aid to protect its coastline from future storms. While bills like this have come up before, it's desperately needed now. Something brought to light in a disastrous way during 2020. In August of 2020, Category 4 Hurricane Laura made landfall in Cameron Parish. Laura brought devastation not seen in southwest Louisiana for decades, but there is one saving grace. Butch Guidry is a parish leader in Cameron. And
Lake Charles would have suffered catastrophic flooding. It would have been terrible, the damage they had from the flooding. Well, the areas further inland missed the storm surge. All of this is not well. More than a total of $19 billion in damages, and even though it's been over two years since the storm struck the region, areas below the intercoastal line in Cameron Parish are still on generator power, meaning no electricity for entire communities. Despite the hurdles, progress is being made. The Just Imagine SWLA project, founded by everyday people in the community, has already begun efforts to increase coastal protection. These levees will keep coastal erosion from washing away the rest of our parish and going on in and destroying the southern end of Calcasieu Parish. We see things slip away slowly, and before you know it, it's all gone. We haven't lost it. We haven't lost it. We can stop this process. A coastal protection and restoration bill would certainly face the issue of funding. We hear it from the Senate and House floor every time big bills are presented. There's a trillion dollar wish list out there for everybody. Everybody wants something, and somebody says, oh, there's money in the Treasury. Guess what? There's not. There's a big hole, a big black hole in the treasury. I discussed the challenge of funding with Barton Yakovzak of the Just Imagine SWLA project. When considering where to spend money too often, Congress considers spending it only where there's a high population base. And so if we just consider protecting that area because there are so few people there, then Congress will never see the value in protecting it. Why should we spend more and more money on a parish that few people live in and has been wiped out by numerous storms in the past? Well, protecting our coastline and Cameron Parish may be more important than you think, not just for Louisiana, but for our global community. Cameron Parish is going to always be your first line of defense against the coastal erosion and what will happen if we don't do something about it. We're also protecting communities, but we're protecting industry, not just for southwest Louisiana, but this is for the, the globe. This is a world economy that's generated right here in our southwest Louisiana region. But if we continue to lose these lands and we're continuing to be threatened by saltwater intrusion and so forth, it, it could jeopardize so much. If we can just receive the funding for some of these projects, we can make a world of difference in order to maintain a lot of the coastal landscape which protects the communities further inland from some of these major hurricanes. Southwest Louisiana is home to a multi-billion dollar liquefied natural gas industry. In fact, the American press states that Calcasieu and Cameron Parishes are exporting more LNG than anywhere else in the world as of 2022. From right here in Hackberry, Louisiana, you will very soon be exporting clean American natural gas all over the globe with the incredible grit, skill, and pride. The 7,000 workers at this facility are helping lead the American energy revolution. Cameron Parish alone is now the world's leader in LNG, liquefied natural gas export. And without Cameron Parish, without that coastline protected, that industry, that participation in the global economy will disappear. With strong and intense hurricanes becoming more and more common, it's now more important than ever to protect our coast, to save our region, and a global economy from disaster. We're gonna keep pursuing this. We will build these levees. We will have these pumps, these weirs, these water control structures, it's coming. We gotta do it, we gotta save our parish. If we do not do anything in order to protect our way of life, our cultures, it could all fade away very quickly.
as y'all remember, <coughs> when we did the redistricting that we finished in December, we had to create about nine precincts to enable you to redistrict in that manner because the precincts here, uh, you know, you have to divide them to get to the right population numbers. That always, we discussed it at the time, that always was going to cause us to have to come back and So what, where we are now in the process is to put back together uh, the merger of some of those precinct divisions so that you can, um, you can have less precincts. So it's not gonna change where anybody votes. We made sure in this proposal that wherever you were voting before, you're still gonna vote as far as the polling location. This is not gonna affect anybody's polling location. Now y'all you have a separate thing on your agenda today to fix the polling locations back to the schools now that the schools have been you know have been fixed that's but that effort of of everybody who votes at grand lake still going to vote at grand lake everybody votes at south camera still going to vote at south camera that's that's the same not changing anybody's polling location with this but what it what it does do and what you do have kind of in your packet to review is basically uh, two things. One is down here in Lower Cameron, there are uh, not, not enough people to populate the precincts as independent precincts anyway. And you were gonna have to consolidate them anyway uh, after, uh, it's January 1, 2025 is when they do the, the 300 voter audit and you gotta, you gotta do it. So on those where it was gonna have to be done anyway, which is um, the, the precinct 12 and precinct 13. Which Location. And, and just because they're in that jury district does not mean they have to vote over there. They will vote at South Cameron School just like just like they would now. Um, so anyway, that's those are those are mergers of actual. Hey, we're taking <coughs> two precincts and going down to one. Uh, the other is a realignment of the precinct structure in the Grand Lake area to match the jury districts. So what you would end up with at the end of all this is in the Grand Lake area, you would have the same overall number of precincts that you started with before we had to create a bunch in the redistricting, but it would be, they would line up, jury district and precinct would have the same boundaries. We think that'll be easier on the public to understand and follow, so we think it'll be you know easier, it'll ease election administration because it reduces the number of machines and commissioners that, that Ms. Susan has to try to find and uh, so anyway, that's kind of where it is. We've been working on this off and on for a while. The steps in the process is that it required the legislature's approval, which we got yesterday, which is why this was an added item. Um, we, we, we finally kind of got that yesterday. And then it requires the Secretary of State's approval for two that, I'm, that are not in here, but that have been proposed and um, so I'm just going to disclose those to y'all since I'm here and I might not be able to come back whenever those come up. Um, uh, the registrar and the clerk recommended that the other thing we do is instead of having separate precincts in Hackberry, that there be one precinct in Hackberry with a lockout of machines. 
and they felt that would be easier on them as far as the number of commissioners. So the 4E and 4W, it is, it is not in this ordinance to merge those together because we are expressly prohibited from merging those since they're in separate jury districts unless the Secretary of State certifies that it will be better for administering the election. So we're waiting to hear that from the Secretary of State. I imagine since it's based on the recommendation of the clerk and the registrar that they will sign off on that, but they hadn't yet. When they do, I know Miss Miss Mary will probably be back with y'all about putting that on a future agenda. But I just wanted to let y'all know that's that's not in this, but that is something that's kind of in the works. The other one that's not in this, but it's kind of in the works, mm -hmm. is there's a little tiny sliver of a precinct we had to create where uh, Mr. Trahan's district kind of went up into Grand Lake above the intercoastal, um, you know, kind of east of Highway 27 there and kind of kind of below, uh, kind of west of Grangerville, all kind of in there. That, that's technically its own precinct, even though it only has like 30 voters. It was necessary to get the numbers right. But again, for the ease of election administration, they would like that merged into the pre-existing precinct 16C, which is all the stuff around it that's gonna be in the, the big district. And again, just administer that little 30 or 40 people as a lockout and that's to make them have less poll workers and all that stuff. So that's also been submitted to the Secretary of State. We're waiting to hear back. If they sign off on that, then again, those two things will be in a follow-up ordinance that may come as soon as next month or if y'all have a special meeting or something like that between now and then. But those two things are proposed, but we're waiting on approval. Everything in here is been approved by the relevant people who have to approve it and if y'all adopt it it can uh, it can go into effect so we, we kind of debated yesterday what to do whether it's just wait and do it all at once or you know come forward and answer any questions about about it and let y'all do this now since it was ready i think we erred on the side of that to give you know miss michelle and miss susan more time to you know kind of factor everything in so that's kind of what it is to be clear this is not changing the redistricting at all the districts as we did them in december are the same it's not changing this is not changing anything where people vote y'all do have a different thing on the agenda to bring them back to the schools but this itself is not doing that this is in uh, cohesion with that you know it took that into account this is just realigning the precincts which i think i'm sure some of y'all may remember we mentioned we were always going to have to do to you know, not have as many precincts. So that's all it is. I'm happy to answer any questions. And separately from that, unrelated to this, but just to kind of help y'all out, um, y'all should each have, and, and I gave Miss Mary the stack, y'all's own district as far as the redistricting goes with the new precinct regime imposed upon it. And y'all have a map of the whole parish with, with the new districts with the new precinct regime imposed upon it. And we also did a great big blow up, because I know these things can be hard to see. We did a great big blow up of the Hackberry, Cameron, and Grand Lake areas, where we're, you know, by not having to capture all the geography of a district and just by zooming in on those little communities themselves, you're, you're able to see the splits, like say between Sonny's district and Curtis's district better in Hackberry, if that's all you're looking at and you're not having to look on the map at the refuge and whatever else. So in y'all's package, you'll have 11 by 17s of the blow ups of not y'all particular districts, but of, of Cameron, of Hackberry, and of Grand, of, of Grand Lake, because those are where <coughs> we have the splits between the districts. And so also there are great big, you know, like the huge maps of those printed along with the parish-wide map that Miss Mary has and if any of y'all wants to get with her and you, you really should be able to see it on those <laughs> because it's, you know, that's the big paper. We also have it in a PDF if, that, uh, that they have if, if y'all want to kind of zoom in on the PDF. That has nothing to do with this precinct ordinance. I just, while I was here, I wanted to make sure y'all had those things and try to give y'all as many resources as possible to educate the public on, on how the districts are. With that, Mr. President, any questions? Uh, I have more. Well, I might have more than that. 
Uh, the one you're saying up in the Rangeville area, the regional precinct, where would they be voting? At? They would still be voting at, everybody up there is going to vote at the Grand Lake School under the other proposal y'all have later on y'all's agenda. So everybody would stay voting there. As it is now, you know, if you adopt this, you would show up and there would be, you know, one table for 16A, one table for 5S, one table for 5N, one table for 16B, and then there'd be a table for 16CE, and then there'd be a table for 16CW. 16CW would be just those 30 people. And so they're like, hey, that's a waste. Let's just have them go to the same table as everybody else in 16C. But when you, but there'll be one machine off to the side that'll be their lockout machine. Okay. So, so that's use them one table but two machines. Correct. Okay. Probably more than two to be honest, but they would have probably just one lockout machine for that part of it. Similarly in Hackberry, they would be everybody shows up at the same place and they're all would be in precinct four, but you'd go to one table and then you'd have this set of machines would be Curtis's district, this set of machine would be Sonny's district. Now again, let me be clear. That component of it, that lockout component, is not in this ordinance. Right. That would be the follow-up thing. If and what's the, what's the, how long do you think that would take to happen? It, the, the deadline for the jury to do it and it to be in, used in this election is four weeks from qualifying. Qualifying is August the 8th, so that means July 8th is the drop-dead deadline for any precinct changes. So, you know, we got a couple of months. It, the Secretary of State, uh, I suspect we'll hear from from them by y'all's next meeting is what I was and it may be before that it's just because I'm just thinking ahead they're trying to speed it up to help Michelle and Miss uh, Susan out give them more time to get this fixed. as soon as we hear from them on those two smaller changes I think I'll get it to Miss Mary and if y'all want to do a special meeting or something but I would suspect we'll hear by y'all's June meeting which would be two months out from qualifying right in a month ahead of the precinct changes deadline. Okay. okay, any other questions? Mr. President, so do y'all wanna adopt what he has completed thus far and then just have a special meeting once this approval from the Secretary of State comes back to Mercy? That will probably help yeah. Michelle and Ms. Susan get a step ahead. If that's the case, y'all need to do the unanimous vote to add the ordinance to the agenda yeah. and all that. Mm -hmm. Hey, did you send this to our personal computers? Uh, I sent it to, to Miss Mary. I don't I don't know if she have it or not. Okay. So y'all should have all the maps then with because the, it was the maps and the ordinance in the attachment. You gonna put that as an add on? Yes, sir. Okay. Anybody Mr. got any Joe. more questions, Katie? No, sir. Mr. Joe. Yes, ma'am. While Mr. Kate's here, do you want him to just explain how the consolidated district uh, election is going to happen for um, you and Mr. Kirk's district where they vote for two drawers. Yeah, yeah, because I can get a lot of them. All right, and, and let me, I, I have the thing I sent Tom on that, so let me pull it up. The, um, and look, the, it's, it's, I know it's unusual if you haven't experienced it before, but it's the same, a multi-member district is used in all of the Larson Act towns, so Lake Arthur, Welch, Benton, you know, they use it for their councils. It's used for the Vernon Parish School Board because they didn't, you know, Fort Polk, which has no citizens, would have otherwise had two school board members, so they put Fort Polk and Leesville together and they elect five out of 10 from a multi-member district that's Fort Polk and Leesville together. So my point is the Secretary of State knows how to administer it and it, you know, I just, y'all just gotta get y'all citizens understanding it because it'll, it will work fine from a, ease of administration. The way it works is if there are two or more offices of the same character to be filled, the number of votes necessary to constitute a majority shall be the greater result obtained by dividing the total number of votes cast by the number of offices to be filled and dividing the result by two and then adding one. Here's what that means in practice. Everybody can vote with two votes in that multi-member district. So you could, you know, if seven people are running, you could go in there and push two votes and have them register out of those seven people. So, 
you know, in a normal election, you get to 50% and you're elected. Well, in that kind of election, you divide that by two because everybody's casting double the number of votes and all. So out of the aggregate number of votes cast, and, and look, this is gonna be slightly, um, slightly, the, um, slightly different than this because some people are gonna go in and you know, Mr. Joe's going to be their buddy, and they're just going to vote that and leave. You know, so it's it's going to be slightly calculated by the fact that some people may not cast their two votes. So it, you know, it's, this isn't exactly like I'm saying. You got to do what I just read in the words, but as a general rule, it's going to be: Hey, if you got to 25 percent, you're elected. Because and so if two people got to 25 percent, well, that means collectively they got a majority of the votes cast and th those two people are elected, right? Because that's the majority of everything that was cast if they're, if they're over that. So if one person gets over 25% and only one, then you're gonna have a runoff from the next highest two people head to head to fill the other seat. So if one person gets over 25, uh, and you don't get that for the other person, you'll have a runoff with the top two, number two and number three, would go to a runoff and whoever wins that fills the other seat. If nobody gets over the, 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 the threshold that I just read, nobody gets to the 25%, then the top four go together in a runoff and whoever gets the most votes, whichever two gets the most votes out of the four gets elected. So, that's how it works, and it's it's. Uh, it, it, I, I do understand that it can be confusing to people, but basically, you know, if, like if you're the number four man, I guess you're wanting to still take your shot, and you're hoping that the number one man doesn't get in, so you're still in the mix or whatever. But, but most of the time, you know, I've I've been the lawyer for Venton for a long time, and they've had the five member council that's elected under that model, and. You know, I don't know, out of four elections, I think two didn't have runoffs at all. They filled all five seats just off of the, major you know, some people, enough people got majority that it was just done in the first round. And in two, they had a runoff for one seat. So, you know, it, my point is, is it, it probably will work out more often than you think that it, it it kind of works in the traditional way where probably one person or two people get in and if you have a runoff at all it's not going to be a four-way runoff it's going to be a traditional runoff of two guys going head to head for the other seat that's just based on what i've seen and i, I tried to look at one point at the vernon example and it was very similar many times all five just got elected and it was over if they had runoffs it was usually just for one seat so i wouldn't suspect <clears throat> based on that, that it'd be very different. Uh, Mr. Barrett did text me to remind me that although the deadline in statute is, um, is, is as I described, that in June y'all are gonna call some tax elections, renewals, and so it would be ideal to have these last two precinct changes <coughs> in effect before then. So if, you know, I would be sure to reach out to the Secretary of State and communicate that to them and then either at that meeting or at the front end of that meeting or uh, in a special meeting, if y'all can have made that change, then that can be incorporated into y'all's exhibit list for, because uh, you gotta do an exhibit list of what are the precincts when you call those renewal elections. Any more questions? Katie, y'all got anything? No, sir. Thank you for the explanation. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, I have another green card for Tom Watkins. Uh, he wants to talk about Restore Louisiana Small Business Loan Program. Good morning. Good morning. Appreciate the opportunity. Uh, my name is Tom Watkins. I'm with South Central Planning and Development Commission. Uh, South Central Planning is a regional planning commission based out of Homa, Louisiana, but we have entered into an agreement with uh, the state, uh, the Office of Community Development with the Division of Administration to assist and manage and roll out this program titled Restore Louisiana Small Business Loan Program. 
Uh, it is a loan program, but the, the nice thing about it is it is 0% interest loans. There are seven year term loans, <coughs> excuse me. Um, uh, if you, the, the loans are between 10,000 and $150,000. Uh, and with the exception approved by OCD, as high as $250,000. Uh, the loans, uh, once you pay 60% of these loans back, <coughs> excuse me, the remaining 40% can be forgiven if you're not in default of the terms of the loan. In other words, if you pay back your loan timely uh, and you're not in default, 40% of that loan can be forgiven. So just a quick math, if you borrow 100,000, you pay 60,000 back, the remaining 40 can be forgiven. Uh, it's not designed for the, the Exxons of the world. Uh, uh, it's for small businesses that still have unmet needs as a result of uh, the storms Laura and Delta. Uh, Cameron Parish, as many surrounding parishes, are certainly within that uh, area approved by HUD and OCD. Uh, HUD is the, the funding agency. So any entity that existed or was operational before the storms, uh, and even those that were operational but today aren't as a result of the storms, can still apply. Uh, it's a little bit different uh, mechanism if you need to if you need to uh, if, uh, come back, in other words, you know, if your business was, was destroyed as a result of the storm, you can still apply. You have to put a business plan together, but we have two or three agencies that will assist that small business owner uh, to prepare that small that, that uh, business plan for free. There are a lot of resources out there for, for businesses in the area uh, that are trying to get back on their feet, still have unmet needs, to use this program. It's a fantastic opportunity. We have a base office out of Lake Charles, but we do uh, have a satellite location at the Grand Lake Library where we have staff. Uh, you can apply for this online. I have some brochures that have the contact information um, uh, with our commission. We have a 1-800 number. We can schedule people. We can meet with people. Uh, we will assist them uh, in applying for the loan getting the information that they need uploaded into the system and, and submitted. So it's pretty easy to qualify. Uh, it, at the end of the day, most of the type of information you would need is tax return type information. 90% of all the information we're going to need, uh, we can pull from that. Uh, there's going to be additional paperwork necessary, but at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's, it's not a terribly complicated. It's a lot easier than a traditional one. So uh, uh, at, at this point, I, I would uh, like to request, if I may, some assistance from the police jury and, and ask permission if it might be possible uh, for us to be able to promote this program in some capacity on the police jury's website. So it's one of the things I've been doing is going around various jurisdictions and presenting the information to the juries or the councils and, uh, and asking <laughs> for those permissions. So um, I'd be happy to entertain any brief questions y'all might have. That, uh, I've got a question. Early. What if you're, if you're still in business but you want to add to it, you know, as far as grow it, can you borrow the money? To do well, so the funds, yes and no. Uh, the, the funds can't be used for just anything. As an example, uh, you can't use the money to repair your building. You can use the money for for costs such as uh, uh, <coughs> mortgages, working capital type things. Oh, oh, yeah, you, you can use, it's working capital. But working capital in their definition means utility mm -hmm. payments, payrolls, expenses connected with uh, uh, hiring, or I mean just say, uh, benefits to your employees that you might have, uh, things of that nature. So uh, inventory, movable equipment, and like I mentioned, you, you just can't use the money to pour into real property. Yeah, well I can understand that you could, as a business owner, you can use this money to pay his bills and use his money to do something else Bingo. if it works out. Bingo, exactly. Okay. Exactly. So. But you have to be in business before. Yeah, you had to be operational before <laughs> the storms. Um, 
you know, so one of the requirements is you have to have a $25,000 annual gross revenue stream. But let's say a, a company started six months before and, you know, it was sort of getting off the ground and it really didn't have that. They'll extrapolate, you know, what you made in that six months over a year and sort of forecast uh, to try to get that. Uh, the programs, I mean, they have requirements you got to meet, but they're going to do what they can to try to, uh, you know, make it as easy as possible that, you know, we can help you cross those hurdles. Since it's HUD, and if your business is making over so much money, can you still borrow that? You know, HUD usually for... You know, so if you, so th this is the great thing about the program. Um, if you have $10,000 worth of physical damages, okay, to your property, or you have a 20% decline in gross revenue, you qualify. And the question is, after that, just how much are you going to be able to qualify for? And that's principally where the tax information comes in. That's a question. Uh, what if you have different ownership of the business? Can so it still apply because the business was there before the storm. It, it, right. So the the entity had to exist before the storm. So uh, there is no there's no requirement that it has to be the exact same owners. Okay. It, it, yeah, because the intent of the program is to get that business operational again or assist in it to help you know spur economic activity and so forth. Um, you know, if, if there anybody that has a 20% ownership stake in the in the in the company is also going to have to put up their own uh, show us your your personal tax returns. But you know, you got to do that with any with any loan you're going to yeah. get anyway. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you. Well, he's going to leave go through, so we're good. Good. Appreciate it. Thank y'all very much. Thank and you, sir. Move on to number four, donation of property located at 2731 Gulf Beach Highway. Yes, so the property owner reached out to us last week, oh, well, a few weeks ago, um, and wanted to know if we would like to accept the donation of this property. He submitted a, a wetland delineation report. CARE has reviewed it. Um, we seem to believe that this could potentially be a property that we could build some sort of fishing pier on maybe um, in the future with some sort of grant funds. We've also talked to our uh, beachfront district board and they said that they would also like time to entertain any ideas on how to utilize this property. <coughs> so if you want to accept the donation, the only negative impact is that it would remove it from the tax roll. Um, you would no longer be able to collect property taxes off of it, but it would be property that you would be free to develop <coughs> um, for any type of recreational use. It's marshaling, so it probably ain't much taxes anyway, right? Yeah, we, we checked with the tax assessor and the DA has looked at it and, um, you know, there's, they're unclear about the, the tax um, repercussions because it was washed out and now it's sort of like reclaimed, but um, it's a good opportunity to go ahead and just take possession of property because if it does happen to, um, have to be returned to the state, then we would have to go and execute some sort of lease with them. So um, this is a very good opportunity to just take it now. How much property are we talking about? Three lots. It's not even a quarter of a, not a quarter of an acre. In your packet, they show the um, kind of where it's at, it's south of 27. Oh, south side? Mm -hmm. um, right outside the Holly Beach um, area, just west of
related to the beachfront district to develop, they want to do some recreational activities out there, or if we wanted to try and build some sort of fishing pier out over the rock, it would be safer for those surf fishermen to utilize that pier. Um, it's far enough out of the way um, that it won't interfere with the beach crowd and, and the crowd that actually lives there and vacations there. They have to walk a little bit, but at least it creates some distance between I think it's three lots, that's 25 by 50, or three times that. So 50 by 75? Yeah, not, not a whole lot of land. Oh, but 72% of it's wetland, so you can't do nothing on it. Well, you can't use it. It's okay. Because you're getting the land free. Well, we, we'll wait for the next storm to warm that sand back in that hole, and it won't be wetland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it is wetland. <laughs> Yes, even though it is wetlands, Harris seems to believe that we could, um, with some sort of uh, low impact <coughs> project, it would be an uh, insignificant amount of just wetland mitigation credits we'd have to purchase. Uh, Mr. President, uh, jury, thank you guys for your time. Thank you for your partnership. Uh, the purpose for me here today is to kind of give updates over what that partnership looked like, how we've been able to save the money. Uh, I can also address kind of head, head, <coughs> excuse me, headwinds in the industry, um, just in general as car manufacturers um, have seen um, some struggles since COVID, and so they're still kind of rebounding from that. But specifically to you guys, um, we have currently partnered 33 vehicles on lease. Um, through through the partnership, um, that total fleet value right now is estimated at 1.17, uh, 1.1 million dollars. Of that money, um, you have uh, 451,000, almost 452,000 dollars is the parish equity in the vehicles, meaning that that is Cameron Parish's money. So when you're looking at um, fleet in general and how the best way to maximize uh, an efficient fleet, there's effectively four ways. There's the acquisition of the vehicle, there's the maintenance, the fuel, and the resale. So when you look at all of that in totality, that's how we're able to provide savings. Historically, we've always went um, through state contracts with the, um, to purchase the vehicles. So from a partnership, governments buy vehicles better than anybody else. The advantage of what we've been able to do, and I'll highlight today, is the resale. By privatizing the resale of the asset, you, it allows us to, to uh, gain margins much higher than what you were doing in the past. Um, so I'll discuss that in, this, in the interim. Uh, maintenance is something, as you have a healthier fleet, we can all agree that older vehicles cost more to keep up. So what we're able to do is have benefits in the maintenance. And then also uh, fuel. So with the federal mandates and regulations when it comes to fuel efficiency of vehicles, and they have to be uh, year over year, the manufacturers are mandated to provide better fuel econo uh, economical vehicles. By having more vehicles in the fleet, you're saving on fuel economy. So um, when we talk about the resale of the vehicle specifically, um, when this partnership started in 2017, um, we had uh, roughly 20, 20 vehicles total by 2020. And so looking at the market and what was going on, um, we made the recommendation to actually uh, cycle out of your first round of vehicles that you had done with this partnership. So we chose 11 vehicles um, that we were able to sell for you through uh, the private sector. What that allowed us, to, uh, allowed us to do for you is replace those vehicles and reduce your overall budget on those same vehicles by 12% year over year. In the same uh, notion, we actually gave the parish back almost $75,000 cash. So we sold those vehicles for more than you purchased it. You had vehicles that you had run for 50 months, so all, a little over four years, and they were anywhere from 60 to 80,000 miles. Off the state contract, we bought those for $29,000.
we sold six of those for over what we purchased it for five years ago. Um, we sold three for right at uh, a break even of about a thousand to two thousand, um, and so that was uh, that has allowed us to fuel the the system and actually reduce your budget year over year, in in conjunction with giving you cash back to the parish to to either put back into other um, ventures that you would see fit. Um, so I have the numbers right here. Um, the average equity you have currently in the fleet, because we did take some of that sales equity and roll back into the fleet, is $15,000 uh, a per vehicle. So effectively today, if you were to take one vehicle and it becomes a spare, you didn't need it, anything like that, we could sell it, pay off the balance, and effectively you have $15,000 cash. That's a huge benefit to the parish because effectively you're working this money um, and can utilize it. So we do it in sessions, right? So we did this in 2021, we sold those 11 vehicles. We did not do anything in 2022 um, because of market conditions. And so we just evaluate that. I meet with Katie and her team, and we evaluate that every six months to just make sure that we're getting recommendations that are going to save money for the parish. Um, in the same tone, we actually increased your fuel efficiency on your fleet by a, about average two miles per gallon last year. So if you antiquate that over the gallons you spent, um, that saved the parish about twenty um, twenty two thousand dollars in in fuel last year, just off increasing the fuel efficiency of the fleet. And in that same token, by having um, newer vehicles under our fixed maintenance program, we're able to fix and budget the maintenance, and so that allowed us to save about forty thousand dollars over uh, maintenance on vehicles that were newer that didn't have to have those repairs um, and things of those nature. Any okay. any questions? We had 20 vehicles in 2020, and now we're up to 33. No, we had 20 with Enterprise Fleet. The rest of the vehicles were um, older vehicles that we had purchased. Year, they were fairly newly purchased, I think 2015, 2016. Yeah, we, we were, and we, we had to sell those fleet. privately. Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a staggered process. So it was effectively a five-year approach. And there's obviously we don't, we still at this point don't help you guys with the entire fleet. And, there's some that don't make sense because there may be a spare vehicle that sets a cemetery that doesn't get utilized very much, so there's not there. But for the working vehicles, um, that's the ones that we're targeting to be able to help you guys with. Um, and by allowing us to, again, um, at Enterprise, we sell, we, you know, we piggyback off of our, uh, the rental car aspect and we sell over uh, a million vehicles a year. So our, we have seven um, individuals in the state that their sole job is to sell vehicles for the other municipalities and clients that we work with. And so they're graded on two things. One, how fast they can sell it, how much money they can sell it for, um, because that's all returned to you. So, and we do this for about, we're, we're partnered with about 90 government entities throughout the state, so multiple parishes, multiple cities, sheriff's offices, things of that nature. Um, and so um, that's, that's what we're doing across the state. But strong, strong savings um, over the first four. We'll look at it again and evaluate it. Um, from a headwinds, obviously the industry um, is challenged. Like uh, I know in the past couple of years, if you've gone to dealerships and, and you've seen that they're very be through this, so they are trying to be um, selective on how they allocate their vehicles. For example, GM this year for their 24 model year is allocating everything. So they allocate X to dealers, X to government, X to what I would consider a commercial client or a non-government client. Um, and they kind of look at the ROI on what's going to be the best for their bottom line. Um, and a lot of that is because the electri electrification of vehicles is coming. And right now, all the three major companies are in the red on their electrification. So they're utilizing their gas and heavy duty vehicle lines to help fuel, you know, the production and offset some of the, the costs there. Um, maintenance continues to be a, a challenge. Um, shops were one, um, hiring uh, and retaining employees, labor rates went up. And then um, on average last year, maintenance costs were up about 17%. So parts are harder. Downtime, which typically is an effective government, but downtime is a huge issue now where um, you're having to wait multiple weeks before parts come in to actually have the resolution or fix. So by keeping the fleet newer, you're getting out of all of those issues where those vehicles can still work and go out to the parishes and get calls 
um, is you can have the uh, public work supervisor or whoever send those out to address the issues of the parish. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you guys' time. Thank you for the partnership. So, Mr. Joe, just to clarify, the parish has two vehicles that we have um, outright that are not in with the fleet. We are now just two left. And um, you've seen an increase in fleet vehicles because we have other entities participating in this program now. The library participates, uh, Grand Water Waterwork participates, Creole Waterworks. So a lot of these ancillary districts are starting to call us and want to get into this program. Good. Appreciate it. Details in, in, in executive session later this afternoon, but I just felt it was appropriate for you and the public uh, to hear some of the progress that uh, we've been making. And I say we is uh, Brookhouse and Keating Law Firm, who you hired to handle your insurance claims on behalf of the entire parish. Um, they mediated. Uh, ambulance districts one and ambulance districts two last week mediations where you go and everybody needs to try to settle the case and they were very very successful put it that way um, your fire and so so those two the ambulance districts are resolved we'll collect the check in the next 30 days disperse the money and they will be fully uh, uh, satisfied under their insurance claim School board building buildings and uh, Cameron Gray had their own policy. The difference between those policies and insurance companies is that the fire and uh, ambulance boards policies do not have this arbitration venue selection clause, uh, which your other policies do, uh, and, and those are significant problems in, in managing and handling and getting these cases settled. Uh, because the insurance companies and, and we have filed uh, with the federal courts to have that arbitration clause declared invalid or not applicable to our situation uh, that issue is now before the US Fifth Circuit so that decision can't say when they're not you know they don't the US Fifth Circuit doesn't follow my schedule they have their own schedule but the briefing uh, of the parties is due, you know. Say about it, but uh, these arbitration clauses give them an advantage, and they rec recognize that, and they've been very uh, unwilling to mediate and try to settle those claims. We, we had tried to mediate some of those cases, and we spent a whole day in New Orleans with insurance companies and uh, a, a very good mediator in the, in the state of Louisiana. And we were not able to make any progress whatsoever. It was so bad that we canceled the next day of mediation. So uh, just wanted to let you know, the public to know, your boards to know that, that you know, they're working very hard uh, to, to resolve these cases, but uh, those matters that uh, involve that arbitration clause and those particular policies, uh, you know, we're just not going to make any progress on those, those uh, claims until the Fifth Circuit makes a decision. And that just may be another six months or, or longer. So any questions? Again, I'll give you some more details in the executive session, but I just thought, you know, some of your boards may hear that, hey, the ambulance and fire got all their money. Why did they get all their money? And some other board, well, it's 
its policy and its arbitration clause is bogging down some claims. So, all right. Great, thank you. Good. Anybody got any questions? All right. Thank you, John. Sure. All right, let's uh, review the agendas. So, Mr. Joe, while you guys are reviewing the agendas, I'd like to give you an update on um, camera night. Uh, we had our annual camera night with the legislators where a lot of the, uh, the tax assessor, the clerk of courts, our court director, a few drawers participated and staff members, we actually cooked for the legislators. And that was an opportunity for us to discuss Cameron's priorities <coughs> and needs directly with the legislators. And I think that it was a pretty <coughs> successful event. Everyone um, loved the food. They claimed it was the best food that they've had all session. Um, so I think that's a, a really good thing. And then also we were able to secure commitments from some of the legislators that are pretty high ranking. They had told us that they understand that our, the breakwaters and shoreline stabilization is priority of the parish. They have committed to trying to make sure that the HB2 um, any surplus funds, it was gonna include money to fund a new extension of the breakwaters. Um, we also secured commitments that they would um, push forward from a P5 to the P1 to um, fund construction of our North Camera EOC slash Grand Lake Multipurpose Building. So right now it's working its way through the session. Um, so far so good, of course it has to be approved by the House, the Senate, and then the governor does have to sign it, but um, we feel really good about the commitments from the legislators that they were going to ensure that this got through, and so in July, uh, So Cal Cam Fair Bullfight event. Back in 2019, the last time they had a Cal Cam Fair, they created this new event called the Bullfight event. And that was um, an event that's hosted half by Calcasieu Parish, half by Cameron Parish. Um, they decided to bring that event back. And so they are asking for that $5,000 sponsorship for that event. So it's, we're, we're Cal Chief and Yes. Okay, thank you. And it's actually, um, she told me it's gonna be the sixth annual Cal County Fair Bull fight. They um, were not able to have it the year COVID and I think the, the year after that, but it is back this year and they're pretty excited about it. So that is the North Cameron EOC through the design of the, when we, find, when we first signed our contract for Amy, we had set a budget of $2 million. Um, it's over the last year, we have went through several design meetings. It's went through conceptual design, through schematic design, um, both with Danny and myself. And after they did the cost estimate, um, updated it, it's actually a $2.5 million building. So the a and &E fee, because of their sliding scale, they're eligible to, um, they're asking for a limit of an additional $10,000. Now that is all gonna be funded through the capital outlay grant. And, yeah. So it's all funded not by us, but by Through the capital outlay grant, yes. So um, once we get some final construction documents, I'm gonna ask that our architects come and kind of present an update to the jury and to the public. Because it is not, it's more than just the building they're gonna redo the entire parking lot from 384 all the way back to the water tower and into the council on aging. So they're gonna dig up everything and regrade it and do all new parking. Um, 22. We actually have a call scheduled about this tomorrow, uh, Tom and I. It is, um, the Attorney General is wanting to file a lawsuit against him exactly what it says um, about their NFIP rate methodology. You know, it's showing that a lot of the coastal communities are seeing an increase in flood insurance. They're not getting the benefit of being elevated. 
FEMA is not refusing to provide their calculations on, on the methodology, but they have not provided it after several people have asked. And so uh, it's my understanding that this lawsuit is to force them to provide it and then negotiate a new way of uh, calculating what your flood policy should be based off of your elevation because it's, it's mainly negatively impacting coastal communities that elevated their homes are not seeing any significant benefit of elevating. Um, we'll find out more about it tomorrow, but there is a deadline on when he can, he's wanting to file litigation, so we're going to ask you um, to consider it. Um, and if Tom, your DA, believes that it, you know, it's something that you guys should sign on, um, we would go ahead and file based off of his recommendation. They're trying to push the coastal side is what they're trying to do. Exactly. But if we don't file and fight it like we did last time, mm -hmm. we're stuck. That's right. Last time we went to Austin, Brandon was going to bring them to Congress, you know, we wasn't mm -hmm. stopping. We, the whole parish was a B zone. Guess what? They come back near the whole parish of AE. So, mm -hmm. You know, if we went and went and did that, then we'd have been stuck with a B zone here today. So we, we got to protect our people and our, our parish. You know? and, and just to kind of give you a, a, a real time example, I, I'm working with some of our residents that um, received elevation funds back in a prior disaster and they have to maintain flood insurance. Um, so when it came time to renew their flood insurance, even though they're elevated now at say 17 feet via fee and, and um, they're taking in the amount of um, your, next, your next side, like what the elevation is um, adjacent to it. So your house might be 17 feet, but they're calculating the difference between your grade and your elevation, and that costs a thousand dollar increase in the premium when they put that amount into the into the insurance. So you were not receiving that's proof right there that you did not receive any reduction in your insurance by being elevated. Ooh, uh. Well, it's, it's a very big concern for everyone. I think this is was probably the most discussed topic when we went to D.C. back in January, and it's something that um, we're going to continue to discuss. Um, we have $500 million in Southwest Coastal that the federal government keeps giving to elevate homes, and part of your commitment when you receive that money to elevate your home is you have to purchase flood insurance in perpetuity. No matter who the owner is, it stays with the property. And so um, the return on that investment was a reduced premium in flood insurance. Well, now with this new NFIP rating for 2.0, you're not seeing the reduced, you're actually seeing an increase in your flood insurance policy. And so who would commit themselves to elevate their home and guarantee that they're going to have the highest flood insurance premiums around? So you're going to see a, a big um, withdrawal of participation in elevating homes. People are just going to. I say we. I say we join in suit and, uh, yeah. and always back out of the door sure, because we're lifting our houses up to 17 feet <coughs> into 150, 160, and 170 mile an hour winds. Yeah. We don't. We don't have stuff that can can stand that. So we're we're the ones that get the raw deal right here. Who yeah. says the cold is on? Who uh was there any kind of pushback? When the local zone was said, the Supreme said that, uh, the board said that? We uh, voted, the jury voted to participate in 1983 is when the jury voted to um, enter and participate. I can let Parrish play the well, what, I'm, history of that. My question is, who draws up the coastal zone? Where, uh, who, who determines where that coastal zone is at? The state. The state. Yeah. And on because everybody would say, you know, south of the inner coast, you know, it's a different world than north of the inner coast. Well, now I'm being told that the coastal zone is the whole parish. State. <laughs> 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 Who sets that, that guideline? In 2012, the whole parish became 
Who inside the coastal zone? And did we have any pushback? No. Could you do. why? The state trumps local, so. The no. state trumps local, but we I don't even remember a fight. Yeah, exactly. There wasn't one. They did. But what I'm saying is, don't the insurance companies uh, justify uh, insuring people within the coastal zone and outside the coastal zone? No. It doesn't make a difference. No, that's why I was referring to where you're talking about coastal zone or flood insurance. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. Well, FEMA has their 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 maps, and that's what insurance companies use, and that's the one that they fall back on after Rita. They try to put the entire insurance. Yeah. How can how could we? Is there any way to force insurance companies to come in and insure uh, in Cameron Parish or North in Cameron Parish? And I was wondering if the coastal zone being moved that had some merit. The federal government can't force them to go to do that. They do what they want to do, and they only come in when they when we can give them forty five million dollars to come in. No, but I, what I'm saying is, you know, if our residents on the North Florida Ferris have never flooded, live in an egg zone, buy double wide travel house, and have to pay six thousand dollars a year on insurance. That's crazy. The trailer beats the codes. My house blew away, the trailer house stayed. It's, it's a no-brainer, I mean. I know, and with this new risk rating 2.0, one of the factors of the mythology is if you're within so many distance from a waterway or a drainage lateral or whatever it is, I mean, that's a factor in it. Oh, I understand, but I'm And then your benefit of elevating two to three feet higher above the BFE, your base flood elevation, you're not seeing that benefit anymore. Okay. Because and what Katie just said, they're going what is, off. What is that distance? I can't tell you offhand, but it's, it's uh, it might be 600 feet. Yeah. It varies? I don't think it's a mile. No, it's a, it's, it's a sediment. It's a I believe it's 600 feet. Um, so yeah, I think it's very, it's very beneficial to the people of this parish and to the businesses that you do consider joining in on this suit. Now, I know you'll get more of the particulars tomorrow, uh, but I do know it's, it's been talked about at multiple conferences that we've had attended. Uh, they're speaking on this, and they're trying to get a lot of parishes involved, and I do believe you're going to have a lot of participation. Yes, this is nationwide. I, I, I understand that. And, our, and, our, and our yet FEMA don't look at Exxon. Right, and number one, FEMA don't look at an Exxon as never, being, never flooding. I'm just saying. Right. Uh, uh, in one manner, you don't have to have blood insurance, you know. In another manner, you got to pay for wind and hell, You have to pay astronomical prices because you got to go to Louisiana Citizens or maybe one other company mm -hmm. that has jacked their rates up. Even from last year, they jacked them up another fifteen hundred dollars in some cases. Well, I, last week I was reading that uh, <coughs> Congress has got people on the red carpet. They brought them, they bring them in because a lot of the policies have been dropped and they're not collecting their money, you know, to fund their program over oh, this 2.0 stuff. And uh, so they was going before Congress on all that. So it ain't, it ain't good for them right now. disaster CDBG funds. Um, Rita, they marketed, I think it was the long-term recovery program. I, they call it the parish um, implemented um, recovery program. Uh, this time they decided to do, it's called the Hometown Revitalization and Resilient Community Program. And so it's two different programs. Um, there's eligible activities in both. Um, you have to do uh, an application where you develop the project ideas that may be eligible. Um, you have to do citizen participation where you have town hall meetings, you um, 
do lots of advertising, soliciting to, to small businesses, uh, minority-owned businesses. And so there's a lot of paperwork that comes with submitting the application for this program. We do not have the staff available to do this. We had to utilize Minville and Associates for Rita and I. I'm not asking why we're going out for third party. I'm just asking That's about the program itself so that people know. Okay, uh, so um, the hometown revitalization is going to be more of the program where um, you go and you take like old part of the community, something that might have been destroyed or, or uh, damaged by Hurricane Laura, and you infuse money into it to reopen it. Um, you can do some small business loans. Um, one of the one of the projects that I'm trying to get clarification on that uh, from state staff to see if it would be eligible would be maybe possibly funding like a community recreation center in the Grand Lake area. Um, I know that's something that we've been talking about. Um, there's a lot of things that you have to meet in order to be eligible though. So back for Hurricane um, Rita, we were able to do one in Hackberry, the community center in Hackberry, with two, the rec center with $2 million. It's different now. You can't just go do rec centers. It has to serve um, a disadvantaged community. It has to be um, serve either maybe low to moderate income, but there is a little caveat. You can serve um, seniors in the community. Um, they're considered disadvantaged, um, your senior citizens. So we're trying to see if they'll allow some flexibility and us to serve that community versus a low to moderate income because if they're going to hold us to that national objective of you know 80 percent LMI then our projects are going to be very limited you have to do it in a community we only have I think three blocks now in the entire parish that are considered low to moderate income and you would have to do the project in that area okay so this this is not for individuals no okay so the resilient one the, the resilient See, uh, programs will differ. You can go and do um, some coastal type projects. Uh, if there was an existing pump uh, station that was damaged, you could use it there. You can't do any new um, coastal restoration protection projects, but you can you can uh, enhance existing ones or repair uh, damaged ones. And then, so that's what we're, we're going to be procuring a consultant for to administer those two programs. There's also a third program, which I'll be able to do that myself. It is the non-federal share uh, program. It's CDBG funds, and what that does is any Cat A, Cat B, PWs, where you had your non-federal share, which ours was about 10%, um, it would cover the cost of that. And, and your Cat A, Cat B is mainly limited to debris removal and any emergency protective measures that um, you may see any building. So a lot of the, the mediation, like water mediation companies that came in, um, <coughs> temporary roofing, all of those projects, anything with the waterworks, that non-federal share uh, program will cover that 10%. Okay. And I, I think I'll be able to do that myself. Right. And the, the expense for this third party will come from this grant? Yes. Okay. Number 21. What is the size on that property? Do you know? Oh, do you remember, Wendy? Oh, it's less than an acre. I think it's like 0 0.83, something like that. It's not very much. We didn't, yeah. We have good. some renewed interest from the public wanting to buy that property, so we're asking um, instead of... Is this where of, we were going to lease the rest of the property? And yes, we advertised to lease. We didn't receive any bids, so this time we're going to actually advertise to sell and see if we have some still bids. 1.52. Yep. I'm sorry. Point five two. Goodness gracious. Point five two. Yeah. I'm going to get it right in a minute. I want to just taste. Yeah. So yes, Tom, 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 Tom. Yeah. 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 Selling this property, we'll place it back on the tax roll, right? Yeah. So, is that the piece that don't connect to the lake? There's some landowners in between. It's on the it's on the bayou though. It's actually on the bayou. Yeah, we're going to make it here now. Yeah, it's on this mess though. Yeah, it's uh, we had some. So, so you just to fill you in, we we it's it had waterfront on the bayou, but you don't 
we don't have access. Now, we are allowed access. We own it as owners. We have historical access. Your, your employees, you can go to it. But we can't allow it. We can't use it for public access because those owners will allow it grant us a public right away to others. So it's of no, it's very limited use to us. Now somebody wants to buy it back or acquire it. So uh, that's what it is. That, that's the problem with property is access. Yeah, we have tried uh, in the past to navigate all that to build something yeah. and we it just you, you could not get the property owners yeah. that are between you and the highway to grant you public access so the public can cross their property. So that's so, it, baby. <laughs> we're we're not number twenty seven this sign sales agreement for 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 demolition. Is that concrete? Yeah. Yeah. concrete right? They're giving it away? Giving it to us for ten dollars. The whole thing. Yes, sir. And they're gonna haul it on site to the room. So uh, that be they're hauling it ten dollars. Yeah. How much they got? That's too much to choose. About thirteen days worth of haul. Where are we gonna put it at? Long Beach Road. On the road itself. On the road. Uh, long road. Yeah. Oh, the one that's washing away. Anybody else? Okay. No, sir. Or I'll take a little break and we come back for the Mr. Time. President, we have that one add on to um, accept and adopt the precinct ordinance. Okay. All right, everybody good? All right, so